So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, October the 20th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 229. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I want to thank you for being here with me today. We're going to talk about uh, all kinds of topics, some of them pretty darn interesting if I don't uh, say so myself. And by the way, I want to thank you for uh, watching my grandson's first question and answer video, which was posted this week and if you haven't seen it you can take a look at it he answers question from sixth graders so that's kind of interesting you might wonder what's going on uh, outside well it's raining right now and it's taken a turn for the worse all of the opening sequences that you just watched were filmed today this morning it went from rain to a borderline sunny now it's back to rain again it's bad news 57 degrees fahrenheit which is 14 degrees celsius 80% relative humidity, obviously, because it's raining, which is probably in the 90s now. And the wind is around 2 miles an hour, so that's not terrible. And guess what? It's not over with. More rain ahead. And those of you who are in the northeastern United States, uh, in my neck of the woods, it's going to potentially frost on Monday. So our fun days in the sun are kind of gone by. One of the things that you may wonder is, uh, look at the things that were in the video that uh, we were looking at the flowers. Okay, so Maximilian sunflowers, they're gone. Goldenrod, gone. And this is why it's really important to get out and about and walk around, see what the bees are still on. You might have noticed some of the bees were wet, clinging. They look like they're going to die, right? They're stuck on the flowers. That's because they were out there foraging. It either got too dark too soon or it got dark and it rained all of a sudden. Those things come hand in hand often. And your bees are stuck out there, but don't be overly concerned because unless it gets really cold and stays cold, those bees will fly back eventually. So you do find bees on the flowers. So this is a great time of year though to look around in your area to see what kind of nectar and or pollen resources might still be available to your bees late in the year. So here we are, October the 20th. We have asters uh, that were videoed that are they're really good. Obviously, when it's wet, the bees don't get anything out of them, really. Uh, so we need some more dry days, and we need it to be in the high 50s, low 60s, with some sunshine uh, for the bees to access that and really get anything meaningful out of them. So asters are good. Cosmos, by the way, which are in the sunflower family, they're annuals, though, which is annoying to me. However, they handle frost, and they still bloom. Uh, and it looks like by the number of buds that I was noticing that are still on those flowers, that they've still got another week or so where uh, they may be providing for pollinators. So that's good news. And it helps you kind of filter out what kind of plants you want to put in your property, in your ground, for uh, late season rewards for your bees. But keep in mind, even though the plant may flower and may produce nectar and or pollen, uh, might be too cold for the bees to forage. So it's kind of a judgment call, but here we are, almost the end of October, and they still have forage. I'm happy about that. The hyssop, some of you have been asking about that. Agastachi, giant hyssop, uh, it's gone by. So the good news of that is, though, you can now collect the seeds, dry them out, shake them out. Some of them require stratification. What is that? That means you have to cycle it through your refrigerator or your freezer and uh, it has to go through a cold cycle before it will germinate. So that's interesting too. Uh, what else is going on? I think that's pretty much it. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description below and you'll see line item by line item all the topics in order. And there'll be timestamps later, thanks to Adam Holmes, which uh, puts those out and then you'll see his pinned comment down in the comment section. We also copy and paste that for those of you who are listening through Podbean as a podcast or iHeartRadio or whatever your preferred podcast support system is. Even Apple Podcast has it. So the way to be is the podcast. Just Google it. And if you already have a favorite podcast that you're using, type it in the way to be and you'll be surprised to find that there it is. Okay, so let's see what else is going on. Uh, if you want to submit your own question, please go to thewaytobe.org and click on the page also titled The Way to Be, and there's a form there that you can fill out. So I have public speaking presentations coming up tomorrow and another one next week. And so this is a perfect time of year for that because you know what? There's not that much you can do in your bee yard. 
So you know who you are if I'm coming to your bee meeting or your uh, banquet that you have at the end of the year or maybe your state. By the way, I will say this. On Sunday, the Pennsylvania State Beekeepers Association is having its annual conference. I get to go for the first time. I'm usually just too busy, but this year I can make it. So that's great. I'm not a presenter. I get to just come and hang out with people and get to know stuff and listen to Randy Oliver and Dr. Jamie Ellis. I have questions for Jamie Ellis, so I'm really hoping I get to meet him from uh, Florida, from the Bee Lab, by the way. Let's get started. I know you don't want to hear any more of the small talk. Question number one comes from Lynn from Hastings, Ontario, which is in Canada, for those of you who don't know. Truly enjoy your content. I have another question for you. At what age do you usually replace your queens? Assuming no issues, I have a queen breeder about one hour away and can order them for a time window. Now that's really handy, by the way, having a queen breeder just an hour away. Uh, so anyway, how long do I keep my bees, keep my queens in particular? And so I try to keep them as long as I can, first of all, but you know, the bees have their own ideas about that. Let's just take a, an example before we talk about all of this. I had, uh, I have observation hives, three of them. I can't keep a queen for a year in an observation hive. Now, some people will happily point out that's bad management. You just don't know how to keep your bees. Okay, well, observation hives are there for us to observe so we can see these annual cycles. And guess what? We're pretty darn good at collecting them when they do swarm out. So every observation hive has a new queen this year. Now, if I'm looking at other hives, and here's where keeping your records is going to be very important. Uh, the thinking is we're too small. You know, backyard beekeepers, you're my target audience. Most of you, uh, by the way, a sideliner beekeeper. Do you know what that's considered? Somebody with less than 500 hives. And then uh, the backyard beekeeper is 50 hives or fewer, hobbyist level beekeeping. So I fall into that category, 50 colonies of bees or smaller. The reason I bring that up is uh, you'll frequently hear from the experts that uh, you need 3,000 hives, you need 500 hives, you need 1,000 hives if you want to have a meaningful breeding program. Okay. So that's probably true. I mean, I understand. They have to control the genetics. They're breeding for specific traits. You need many, many generations from hundreds, if not thousands of queens to do that. Good for them. Um, but what I do here is maybe it just is a feel good thing for myself, but I keep my queens in the top performing hives. So what do I mean by a top performing hive? Now this is regional. So the bees that you work with will do the best in your own environment. They make themselves known. Uh, the biggest challenge that we have, and we're gonna talk about this a little later today. Uh, the biggest challenge that we have is of course, getting your bees through winter. For backyard beekeepers, getting your bees through winter is kind of the test of beekeeping ability. You know, we claim a win every time a bee survives. We blame the rest of the world every time a colony does not make it. So we're gonna talk about that later. But uh, I still do things as if I were running a huge operation. So what I'm doing is I'm picking based on the traits, the behavior, disposition. Are they hot? Are they easy to manage? Do they produce the things I want? And my favorite thing to observe in beehives, low varroa mites, low treatment requirements. And of course, um, uh, they not only that chew the mites, but stay healthy and also come through winter well with minimal care. And I understand what does that mean, minimal care? Well, I've arrived at my final hive configuration that I think is working so consistently well that I think it's gonna stay this way with insulated inner covers, double boxes or single brood boxes going through winter. And that's just based on, of course, the size of the colony that's in it when you're packing down for winter. But uh, I try to, when I'm identifying the colonies that I really like, the next part of, you know, are they honey producers, are they foraging great? Are they flying out doing cleansing flights when they're supposed to? Now, this is muddy water. Let me just explain that. Um, the colonies that do well like that, I wait until the queens are a couple of years old and then I intentionally divide the colonies with walk away splits. So you understand what I'm saying here? Walk away splits. I pick out the colony in spring. They are getting ready to swarm. I wanna keep that queen, so I remove the queen. 
I put her in a nucleus hive. Now I have to track that queen, so how do I do it? In order to know how old the queen is, I have to identify her myself, so I do that multiple ways. One is I paint a dot on the thorax. Okay, now there are five colors that people paint, and this is kind of a world standard, right? We just like this year is red. Next year will be green, right? So uh, if you follow that, then of course, when you're buying queens in and things like that, and the thorax is marked, then you know what year that queen was produced and how old it is. You can come up with your own color scheme, and there are a lot of reasons why you might want to do that. Uh, if, you're, if you're coming up with these different colors for yourself, then uh, you know that's your queen. First of all, if it swarms out and a neighbor says, ah, I just kind of swarms, it's really awesome. You say, what color was the thorax? And then they say it was uh, chartreuse, and you go, yeah, that's mine. Give it back. So it identifies your stuff. Anyway, uh, some people like to keep their queens around. So anyway, I know this is, I'm all over the chart with it. How long do I keep my queens? I replace them in their third year. So if I've got a really long standing, really good queen, but guess what? I don't even kill her and get rid of her. Even though she's two years old going into her third winter. So that's how I gauge it. How many winters did they go through? Uh, I pull that queen and I put her in a nucleus hive with some brood and I see if she continues to make it. Now, how much longer does she go? What's the oldest queen I've ever kept? I never had a queen go four years. So, and that could be, again, it could fall right on bad bee management on my part. But see, I like to breed for longevity. See, I don't want to, this is, these are the kind of discussions that round table beekeepers have, you know, round table discussions where they're talking about, well, you're just going to replace your queens every year anyway. And then other people will say, well, if you do that, you're breeding for queens that will uh, swarm a lot. So if you're constantly collecting swarms and cycling those back and you're collecting them from colonies that generate several swarms a year, are you not breeding for swarming? Do you see how messy it gets? So what I do with my bees and how long I keep them and, you know, I, I, I might be kidding myself breeding for longevity, but two years I think is really good. There are other people that are going to say they put in a new queen every year to make sure they survive winter. There are other people that will say they're going to do a heavy formic acid treatment, formic pro, whatever they're going to use. They're going to double dose them. By that I mean not following an illegal dose, but using two packs at once, hard hit, knock out all the varroa mites. And they go ahead and do that in conjunction with replacing their queen. So let me explain the thinking on that. You've got a colony. The brood pattern's not awesome. It looks like they might have some varroa destructor mites in there. Their levels might be high. So you're planning already here, as Lynn is, to go ahead and get a new queen to replace it, right? Well, if you have the new queen inbound anyway, and it's a highly productive laying queen of known genetics from a great breeder, and I'll get to that in a second, um, you could do that formic treatment and uh, damage, if not destroy the queen. Some people just remove the queen anyway, GP. And now you're going to knock out all of your varroa mites in theory, and now you're bringing in a new queen, and you're installing it in a clean hive that's varroa mite free. And I could see where somebody who's running a satellite apiary and uh, that has a, maybe 20 or 30 hives in that apiary, they do this to every single hive in the apiary. This runs into a lot of money if you're buying queens. So they would treat every hive in that satellite apiary and then they replace all the queens at the same time. Now they have a queen colony that's going to go into high production. And some people will say, well, man, but also Formic Pro kills a bunch of the bees. Like you'll see a pile of dead bees, which is very alarming for a lot of backyard beekeepers. Now you have a pile of dead bees too because they couldn't handle it. And your queen's dead. Look at the damage there. But here's the argument on the other side of that. Yeah, but you wiped out all of the varroa destructor mites in your entire apiary. And now they're going to recover quicker. Let's say you're looking at a thousand dead bees in front of every hive. Let's think about that. That's one day of egg laying for a healthy queen. So you gave up a full day supply of new production, not even a full supply, because if they go to the numbers of 1,500 or 2,000 eggs a day, then that means 21 days down the line. That's how many new bees are emerging in the colony. So the rebound is really strong when the colony is very healthy and varroa mite free moving forward. So do you see how the logic all balances out? I know this is clear as mud right now. So um, 
I'm just telling you what a lot of people do. Some people recycle their queens, new ones every year. And that's why if you had a big beekeeping operation or you're headed that way, you're going to want to get into queen production on your own. So now you're raising your own queens because that's basically free. After you get all the nukes that you need to do that for queen rearing, and there are queen rearing boxes, by the way, they're really tiny. Um, queen finishing, there are starter colonies, finisher colonies, and then of course you have breeding yards. And here's where, see what I mean? It gets into thousands of colonies of bees, and you have to have an area where you're not being encroached upon by a bunch of other beekeepers with other genetics. So uh, these days that can be very difficult. I'm going to move on from that. I messed up that question completely. Question number two comes from Timothy from uh, Roseburg, Oregon. I have a question about taking notes during inspection. I'm curious what you would suggest for taking notes with gloves. I want to keep records digitally, but I'm not sure what to try. And my initial ideas are to use a phone, screen pen, or having paper and transferring the notes to a computer later I'd love to hear if you think it's a good idea or if I should try something else. And uh, this is Tim B. All right, so here's the thing. I constantly tell people, as often as I can, please keep notes. And I know that that's inconvenient. If you're working by yourself, it's really inconvenient. If you're making videos, it's impossible because it's going to slow you way down. That's, you know, I could breeze through my bee yard in a fraction of the time. But when you have to make videos to document the things that you're doing, it slows your way down. If you have to document as you go, um, that can slow your way down. Plus everything gets all sticky, right? So I have said in the past that uh, there are apps for your phone that document your hive inspections. There's Beekeep Pal, which is one that I've used in the past and that's with your phone. It became cumbersome. I'm not gonna say it's not a good app. I'm just saying that constantly updating it uh, becomes a chore and it gives you alerts. You haven't checked this hive for mites in 21 days. You haven't done this. You haven't done that. So they give you these alerts and stuff, but I realize that's not the scope of the question. The scope of the question is how to take notes while you've got your big clumsy gloves on, even if it's just your nitrile gloves, which I much prefer. If you're wearing those, you can touch the screen on your phone. Now phones have recording, voice recording built into them. That's another thing. You go Googling for that and you're gonna find out there's apps for everything, but guess what? Chances are you've got a smartphone, it has voice recording built into it. But here's the thing, now you have to carry your phone with you and in your bee jacket, it'll be right in your pocket. Some people don't wear bee jackets. Some people just wear long sleeve t-shirts or just t-shirts. Where is that phone gonna go? Uh, the other thing is your phone gets all gummed up, no matter how careful you are. And you have to stop to do it. You have to put stuff down. You have to push the button. You have to hit record and do stuff. So I'm going to make a long story short. Too late for that. I know. Look at this thing. Now this was the thumbnail for today. What? Look how little this is. And this thing is made really rugged, by the way. This is a digital voice recorder. And uh, it plugs into a USB-C for charging. So it's got the little thing on the side there. And I bought this. I did not ask somebody to give this to me so that I could review it because I'm not going to do a complete review, but I am going to explain it to you guys. And that is that it has these little microphone pickups in it, but it also has a jack on the side. If you wanted to have a little um, lavalier mic and clip it like on your collar or on your ball cap brim or something like that. But let me tell you something, you don't need that. And that's because I've tested this over the past week. I decided I would run it through stuff. All you have to do with this thing is turn it on and the little welcome sign comes on and then guess what you do? It shows the recording levels and how much time has been recorded. All you have to do then is hit the record button and it starts right there. But guess what I've got this set on? Voice activation. So while I'm talking right now, it better darn well be recording what I'm saying. And look how far it is from my face. Let's say we're talking to the person that's helping us out. It's going to record everything. And then I stop talking. Then I start talking again. Now, that gap, when I wasn't talking, it was not recording. So it's voice activated. 
And then so we hit stop. And then if we hit playback, oops, I forgot to stop it from recording. When you hit stop, it says saved. Then I hit play. I'm sorry, this is taking so long. And it starts right there. But guess what I've got to set on? Voice activation. So while I'm talking right now, it better darn well be recording what I'm saying. And look how far it is from my face. Let's say we're talking to the person that's helping us out. It's going to record everything. And then I stop talking. Then I start talking again. Now, that gap, when I wasn't talking, it was not recording. I love it when a piece of technology actually works when I can't back up. So that's what it did, and it didn't record the gap. So how do you carry it? Look how tiny it is. You put this in your pocket, you lean forward, it falls out. So I'm going to nerd out. I know what somebody's going to say. As soon as you put on some kind of neck purse or whatever you want to call it, somebody's back to going, man down, right? No. You take this little thing, it's on. You put it, you push your record button. It's in voice activated. You drop it in there. You put your Velcro on there, and this is an adjustable strap. It goes around your neck on the outside of your veil or whatever you're wearing. And now it's going to record whenever you talk. You have nothing to record, you don't speak. So here we are. Langstroth Hive number 72. Three boxes, brewed. Today's date is. So you do the whole thing. You give it the start date, whatever, just like, you know, back in the Star Trek days, it would start date, some, whatever number. And then, uh, you talk about what you see, you know, full of honey, seven or eight, whatever frames of honey we've got brewed. We're missing the queen. All the things that you want to say, it records. When you stop talking, it's not recording. So I think this thing is pretty sweet. And so this is what, uh, because this question actually uh, got me motivated to look into this a little more. By the way, one of these cases like this, that costs you $14. I bought these. This is not a sponsored thing at all. That Ainsworth deal is $37, but I'm telling you that it is made extremely well, and guess what? You don't have to touch it um, after you turn it on. You just put it in the pocket, put it around your neck. You got to record something. You got somebody sassing you, and you need proof of that. Voice actuated, have it in your pocket. What was that you said? And then you get a full recording of the whole thing. I'm not saying you should be recording people without them knowing. I would never say that. I'm just saying, voice actuated. It's going to sit dormant, waiting. How many hours can you record? Like like 4,000 hours? or let's, let's say I'm wrong. Maybe it's 400 hours. If you have 400 hours of audio, that's too much. But anyway, uh, talk to your voice recorder. Voice activated. The battery lasts forever as far as you're concerned. And uh, it recharges through a USB-C and uh, you're good to go and then when you're all done and you've got your coffee or whatever it is your hot chocolate your hot cider this time of year because it's october you're inside now you break out your log book and you have the hive number that you named right away and you go through and now you document your results much better than actually writing things down so i want to thank timothy for that you helped me spend my money but i also have a new fun toy that's actually very practical so it could be whatever you're doing. If you need to take notes or you're interviewing somebody, you want to take notes. You want to make sure you don't miss anything. There you go. Second uh, backup for your audio. And it does record in stereo or mono. So there you go. Moving on. Question number three. This comes from Beth in Auburn Town, Tennessee. With a general consensus that an apiary should be treated for Varroa and not just the hives with high mite counts and the thought that, I think it meant uh, VSH because it says VHB, hives may not need to be treated and if they are, they may lose their hygienic behaviors. What do you do in the case where you have a hive that really needs to be treated but have two hives with zero out of 300 for mite counts? Do you treat them anyway? The other hive was 5 out of 300. It does not have a VBH, VHB queen. I think it's VSH, which is Varroa Sensitive Hygienic. I could be wrong. There might be another acronym. 
But uh, thanks. Anyway, see what you're doing at the B classes with your grandson. Right. Thanks for watching that, by the way. And someone did ask why there are no comments under my grandson's Q&A. And that's because YouTube has standards where if a child is the focus of the whole thing, and if it's for children to learn, which it is, so his whole conversation is for kids, no comments are allowed. That's uh, YouTube's policy these days. Okay, so um, when you're treating, this is what I do. I don't treat every colony in my apiary. And I know the bees are just a big mess out there. They are going into each other's hives. But here's my thinking. This is my logic. Um, when I find a colony that requires treatment, first of all, what do we just talk about? Keeping logs, documenting what you're seeing, which colony it is, what their performance is, how defensive they are, things like that, all these traits. You find that you have, and I did have one this year, I had one colony that was really loaded with furrow destructor mites, so I treated it with uh, oxalic acid vaporization because it was at a time of year when the brood was actually pretty darn small. So, and it was effective, by the way. So that's the other thing you have to validate later if your treatment worked. Other colonies were not demonstrating high mite levels. Now, it's important to document before treatment which colonies were doing extremely well and which colonies were not. And the reason is we're going to track queen performance because that's really what all of that comes from. So when you document the queen performance, you've got these top performing hives. What would I do in the case as described here? One colony with only five mites out of 300, right? So that's pretty low mite numbers, actually, because there are people around here that when they count their mites, they get 50, 60 or more. I've never had that. Uh, I've had high mite counts once, and that was several years ago, and I discontinued the line of bees that I was working with there. I was trying them out. It was a complete bomb. So now um, I cycle back all my own stock. So the other thing is uh, I try to keep the mites out of the entire, I treat it as described here, as if my apiary were an entire community. And we're looking at your backyard apiary as a community that is spreading and sharing diseases as well as benefits, right? So you identify the outliers and we don't breed from that colony. So what could you do? Well, I would treat that colony that had, but by the way, that's not a high mite load, especially this time of year. This time of year, most people will be seeing the highest mite loads of the year, depending on how you've been managing your bees throughout the year. Because what's happening? The brood is dwindling. The bees, now this is, well, Auburn Town, Tennessee, so I don't know how warm it still is there. But if it were happening up here, people are shocked that they get higher mite levels at this time of year. And it's usually because, I have to explain, that your numbers are lower, the number of bees for your mites to feed on are fewer, therefore the mites congregate and go after your brood. What are they also missing? Drones. So the drones are on their way out. There's nothing left but nurse bees, and we have the, even the better bees that are in there. The fat-bodied winter nurse bees are in there, and those are prime targets for your varroa destructor mites. So you see your numbers, they seem to spike, but really I think it's the same population of mites. I think there are fewer bees for them to feed on. So you see these numbers come up. I asked this, uh, Randy Oliver was giving a presentation to my bee club, the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association. And uh, I asked him that very question. I said, if you have a small apiary and you've got some that have high mite numbers, would you or would you not treat all of those hives as if they all had the mites in order to give these varroa destructor mites no sanctuary. So he reluctantly said that he would. So I like that answer. I think that when you have a small collection of beehives in your own backyard and one of those colonies is uh, showing a high mite load, and if you're gonna treat them, especially with an organic treatment, something that's not really hard hitting, uh, like oxalic acid vaporization, I have no problem with hitting all of the hives after I've documented what the loads are. And then I want to come back later and see by the mite drop. This is going to tell you, because keep in mind, even though you had zero mite counts in those other hives, it doesn't mean they don't have mites. And here's what I'll explain. 
Hopefully you have a removable tray or an insert of some kind under your bottom board so that you can pull it out and see dead mites. So this is my recommendation. Remove all your trays, your core flute inserts, whatever you have, clean them all out, put them all in place, do the treatment on all of your hives. This is going to let you know if all of your hives also had mites. So if they do and you see a, a drop, you see an example of the effectiveness of the treatment that you just applied. You killed a bunch of mites. And you'll hear people sometimes say, well, that really doesn't do anything. Well, it did something to the mites that are dead all over those bottom boards. And then you would be shocked to learn that maybe one of the other hives that you didn't get a mite in your count, maybe one of those hives um, actually had a lot of mites in it and you just missed them. So if you've got a mite loaded colony in your apiary, and again, I don't want to say that the five out of 300 this time of year is heavy. It's not. Um, if that were in spring, then yeah, it's different because they've got all summer to reproduce and expand and explode and their numbers increase. This time of year, they're in a drawdown. So treat them all. You're at a time of year when you can really get a handle on them. And the more we knock them down this time of year, the better off we are. And again, that's a soft treatment. That's an organic treatment. Uh, now, I prefer to do my end of the year mite treatments at uh, the end of November, so the end of next month and the beginning of December. This is key. And it's because I'm specifically mentioning oxalic acid vaporization. Once I mention that, I don't want somebody to run out there when it's 48 degrees and hit them with OA. Uh, and the reason is your bees, when it's cool outside, so if it's below 60, it's kind of a it's a vague number because below 60 and sunny, it could be a little different. So over 58 and sunny, this would still work. But 60 or above and even overcast, the bees inside your hive would have a loose cluster. This is very important when you're going to deliver oxalic acid vaporization. So if we're down in the 50s and overcast, I wouldn't do it because you're kind of wasting it. Uh, the, if they're clustered at all, they fan and they keep the OA away from what? Away from the brood, away from the target area, away from those nurse bees that are in the center of the cluster of bees. So we need a warm day, middle of the afternoon, two to three, lots of bees are coming and going. And some people will say, yeah, but what about the foragers that are out there that don't have, uh, that won't get the treatment? Our target is the nurse bees, the nursery, which are the brood frames. That's what we really want to hit, and they're all inside. So I don't worry about the foragers out. In fact, having them out of the way, I think, improves efficacy. So, yes, I would treat uh, your yard, as, especially on something as inexpensive as that. If I were doing something that was really invested, that required me to pull everything apart, like if you wanted to do, you know... Um, Anything that costs a lot of money that requires you to put the treatment directly on the frames or run a mite away quick strip in between the frames or something like that. I hope you would have done that before now. I would not do that this time of year because I don't want to pull all the hives apart because you have to do it twice. Once to get it in. The second treatment, uh, the second part of that is you have to pull everything out. Do not leave treatments in past the recommended treatment cycle. If it's something you have to install, if it's a pad, if it's some kind of, if it's time all, if it's whatever it is, please take it out at the end of the required treatment. And the reason that we want to do that is because when you go past the treatment cycle date, um, it's, if it's still present, now we have lower levels of it and you have an opportunity for resistance to build. Don't do it. Always get that stuff out of there. But that's why another reason that I like oxalic acid vaporization, I am opening nothing. Nothing stops me from going and doing that. You know, if it happens to be one of those nights where it's 69 degrees, some freak weather thing, and you're at work and you got home and it's already dark, which, you know, it gets dark at 5.30, quarter to 6 or something like that, but it's still warm out. Could you go out and do the OA treatment? You sure could because you're not pulling anything apart. In fact, you're just going to lay a damp cloth over the entrance and then you're going to have a quarter, if you've got, you know, like a ProVap or an Instant Vap, or a Lorabi's vape, whatever they are. Um, if you can fit it into a quarter inch hole, then it's not invasive at all as far as the way the equipment is set up. So you can actually do that. And those are my recommended, my personally 
recommended. That's my favorite method for delivering oxalic acid vaporization. So yeah, that's what I would do. Moving on. This comes from Paul from Kansas. It says for the podcast, can we get an intro or chapter markers to skip the random music intro outro? The only reason I'm okay with it is I have timestamps to match to the video. Okay, so the timestamps will match the video regardless of what we do with the audio. So I am going to make this change because I realize people are listening to the podcast for Pete's sakes today at a two minute opening. Um, and who wants to sit through two minutes of random music with B sounds in the background? So what I'm going to do going forward, because Paul asked for it, Paul M from Kansas, um, I'm going to trim off the intro and I'm going to trim off the end. If I had one of those endings of the Q and A where sometimes I show the environment and there might be a 10 minute video that just shows a bunch of bees foraging or something like that. I think it's, it's only fair that I should trim those things off so that if you're listening as a podcast, you don't have kind of the equivalent of dead time, right? So we're going to just talk. So I want to thank Paul for that. Uh, that's a very good recommendation. And I will do that. I'll trim the audio track before I upload it to Podbean. So thanks for that. Number five comes from Anthony from Elkton, Virginia. I have two hives that appear queenless. Both became very defensive during the summer dearth. And now as I'm packing them down, there's a large population, but no eggs or larvae. The last of the brood is currently emerging and I have not been able to find the queen in either one. Also, there are no queen cells or cups anywhere. My question is, could this be a genetic thing that the queen has ceased laying before the other colonies around it? We have not had our first frost yet. Goldenrod is just about done blooming here. Thanks. Okay. So yes, all your colonies do not behave the same. And this is where we talk about locally adapted stock. And I was talking with another beekeeper um, at a meeting that we just had. He just happens to live not even a mile from me. And I asked about his stock. Is it going through a transition? Are your bees getting darker? Are you seeing black bees in all of your hives? Are they taking over? Because I happen to know that over the years he has built his apiary free. He just grabs swarms here and there. So I would say that his stock might mirror mine. So genetically, we are getting um, what I think are carniolans or lines like that, darker bees that handle winter really well. But there are some distinctions made. So when you're looking at them, they have traits and they have behaviors. Now I realize we're talking mutts here because we're not running these big breeding operations and we're not buying in purebred stock that's been, you know, bred from known drones and things like that. We're not inseminating. We're turning things loose and we're letting them breed in the environment. But my stock is changing. And uh, I particularly see this because we have observation hives. The beauty of that is I can just look at them anytime I want to. I go in that building and see what's what. Now, um, I also have carniolans this year that I brought in. And historically, I like to bring in bee weaver stock because of their traits, their genetics. And we'll talk about that more in the future. But they do not go into winter the same. So, and, and even summertime. If you've got a period during the summer, you'll find that some of your colonies back off. It's almost like they can read the future a little bit. Uh, they back off on egg production because it's a direct reflection of resources coming through the entrance. So what foragers are going out and getting and in what quantities and what quality it's coming in has an impact on the queen's nutrition because she's being fed by nurse bees, which again are being fed by forage. And then, uh, so queens can start to back off on their production. Some of them are more sensitive to those cues than others. For example, because I'm going to name some breeds, some lines, some genetics. I had Italians years ago. I met a guy, you know, he came up and had to meet him in the McDonald's parking lot. I don't go to fast food at all. So I was already a little jumpy being in a parking lot where people uh, sell you food that's not even food. You know, the smoking French fry and all that. Super size meat, great documentary. All right, I'm off the trail. Anyway, he met me there. He hands me these packages of bees. I take them to my apiary. I install them. And they were all Italian line bees, right? 
and I was all excited. Those things went to work fast. Not only that, they exploded. And people always say, they exploded. Their, their population increased so fast, it was alarming almost. And uh, because I had other bees right next to them, that you would think in parallel that they would all be producing the same rate, the same number of bees, and getting honey, like ridiculous quality quantities of honey. I had three supers on that hive by July. And uh, that was a package. That should not have happened. The brood was huge. Now, here's a drawdown. Here's a drawback on that. I'm going into fall. Now, I'm not a honey producer. I just like bees. I'm studying bees. I look at bees. I like to see how they do. And I like to tell other people what I see. And I like to photograph them and video them and see what they're about. And those Italians overloaded me with honey. Now, what they didn't do was draw down their brood numbers when we got to this time of year. So it was a colony where, um, just like when people are packing down their colonies, and say, ah, how can I do it? There's three full boxes of bees. What am I supposed to do? Well, you're stuck. If, if you have three full jammed boxes of bees this time of year, you're kind of stuck with that. But you know what those Italians did? They ate me out of house and home. So at, back then, I was leaving 70 pounds of honey on going through winter, and it wasn't enough. They consumed it all. They went right to the bottom of the uh, inner cover, and they starved to death. So there are two things I could have done. One, leave a lot more honey on, or do what a lot of commercial people do, uh, back feed two to one sugar syrup at the right time to keep them loaded and keep them going. Uh, when I hear about people like, I want to give them protein and pollen sub and I want to give them pollen patties and all that stuff in the fall to build up this massive brood so they're ready in the spring. I personally never do that unless I'm doing a test for someone to see how well it works. So like I didn't even want to do the test with the Hive Alive pollen patties that came out that I talked to them about them uh, at the conference last January and then I said well I'll use them on nukes to build things up and, and what that does is it gives the bees a lot of resources inside the hive and you can build brood out of sync with what's going on outside. I see the value of it. I mean, if you want that, you may be listening right now going, yeah, I really want to get top performance out of these hives, regardless of what's going on outside. Because just like what's going on where I'm living, we have days ahead of nothing but rain and cold and then a frost at the end of it. You could put a pollen patty in there and boost them and they don't have to go out to get the pollen. Therefore, they are keeping their... Uh, standard of brood up. But I have also, so the Italians will build on almost nothing. It's weird. Like they can really get resources and build their brood in spite of what's not coming through the door. Eat yourselves, eat themselves out of house and home, starve and die in spring. So I do not recommend them. That is the most popular line of bees throughout the United States. Italians. They're good bees. If you're in the north, the northeast, if you're in my state, from the snow belt and things like that. And keep in mind, I just want to study the bees. I don't want to be hauling around a 55-gallon drum of honey. I don't want it. I just want to study the bees. So that's why I actually like, and the Bee Weaver line does this too. Bee Weaver, you won't see listed in a lot of uh, lines of bees that are known to uh, function with varroa destructor mites and things like that. They've recently been added to a list from Cornell that um, identified them as being able to live in the presence of varroa destructor mites without being overwhelmed by them. Ah, so they got mentioned. So that's good. But we have Russians now and we have Carniolans. And the very first thing I notice about these bees, other than their conspicuous dark coloration, is they have very small brood patterns early. Like right now, they have what's described in this question. I don't see eggs. I don't see brood. Not seeing them doesn't mean there isn't some pocket in there, but when I'm looking at my observation hives, they're in frames of three, so I have four surfaces I can't see. So I'm seeing the outside of the first frame and the outside of the third frame, and what's going on sandwiched in between, uh, I don't know. So how would I find out if they even have any brood at all in there. Thermals. So here's some of the ways you can tell. And I realize when you have beehives out in your yard, you're not going to be able to look at them and know where they're clustered and whether or not that means there's brood or not. 
But when you have um, observation hives, you can do thermals because here's what I noticed they do. Because I went out there this morning to see it. Uh, they cluster over the outside of the frame that has brood sandwiched between the frames. So they're, they're adding an, a layer of insulation with their bodies. So then I know that there's brood in there. So it's really interesting. And where's the brood located? In the bottom third. That's perfect because now they have all the space above them to move up and they're small pockets of brood, right? But it's there. So that's all I need to know. And I know, as I mentioned before, that all my queens are uh, young, fresh, and ready to go right through winter in my observation hives. But I'll name the ones that are notorious for having small brood in times of dearth, early, and also near the end of the year. So Russians, Carniolans, Caucasians, and Buckfast. Most of the bees that you're getting now are hybrids of those, but uh, you're exactly right. You can have colonies perfectly healthy, doing exactly what they're supposed to do, but genetically predisposed to have a smaller brood in periods of dearth. And those that don't do that, I don't know what their triggers are. I don't know what's going on, why Italians do that. Maybe somebody else has an answer for that. And this may be the reason why some of these commercial guys are driving around with those 900 gallon tanks of sugar syrup on the back of their tractors and stuff and filling up these, you know, the beehives to make sure that they have this heavy syrup going into winter because maybe they have some of these large brood types of genetics going on out there. And uh, they need those numbers because when spring hits, they can't wait for a buildup. They have to be there for pollination services. Back our beekeepers, we don't have to be there for any pollination services. I want them to be slow because you know what I don't want to see on the first day of spring when I walk out there and we have the first hot day and I get to go out there with my cup of coffee and you see swarms and trees. I don't want that. If they build up really fast, you have to be ready to expand them really fast. So, it might just incoherent, maybe on this whole Q&A today. I don't know if I'm giving you good information or not. I hope it's good. Question number six comes from Timothy from Toki, Japan. T-O-K-Y-E. So, I hope I said that right. So, it says here, oh, this is an interesting one. I mean, they're all interesting. This one's interesting, too. You often talk about bridging the gap between treat and treatment-free beekeepers. When will you do an interview with a natural treatment-free beekeeper? One like, and then uh, Timothy names a beekeeper here and names the YouTube channel. I'm not gonna name the beekeeper or the YouTube channel, but because we're gonna talk about the philosophy, right? I've been watching you for three or four years now, maybe longer. So far, you've only, to the best of my recollection, you have only had two different interviews with treatment-free keepers and then it says uh, jeff mr ed or dr leo s there wasn't a lot of talk of treatments or ipm and then again this other beekeeper and it has 400 colonies for years exceeding your last uh q a three years timeline before they are overcome by the varomites in the interest of sharing both perspectives bridging the gap and giving others the information that they might have Considered, I consider I am constantly ruminating over everything I hear. Thank you. Okay, so one of the things I don't do is I don't name other uh, YouTube channels that I'm not familiar with. I've never heard of that beekeeper. Okay, so and because of this uh, question, I did look them up. And uh, they've only been even producing YouTube videos about their bees for less than three years. So I can't vouch for the person. But the other thing is I interview people, uh, especially when it comes to treatment or treatment free. Jeff Horchoff, Mr. Ed is treatment free. Um, he has a huge apiary down there. He runs the Abbey apiary. And uh, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have mites or other things. I don't know if he's cycling in a whole bunch of bees. I don't know what his losses are. I don't know those details. But uh, we didn't get into a big conversation about treatment-free because he's not doing genetics. In other words, he's not producing his own stock and things like that. So what I try to do in my interview series is interviews with experts. And uh, you mentioned Dr. Leo Sharashkin. Dr. Leo Sharashkin is treatment-free and he's following, um, you know, beekeeping with a smile and uh, only inspecting your hives twice a year and things like that. 
I don't fully subscribe to that method of beekeeping. Uh, and the reason is you need to know what's going on with your bees. And if you're going to be treatment free, and I was for 10 years, uh, if you're going to be treatment free, it's active bee management. You need to know what's going on. A lot of treatment free beekeepers don't count their mites at all. They don't even know what the numbers are in their hives. And they either lose a hive or they survive. That's it. And Dr. Leo is a great guy. And he said that he realizes that what he's doing with his bees, keep in mind, Dr. Leo owns a thousand acres of forest. And uh, where he's managing his bees, he does not have a lot of competition from other beekeepers. And therefore, he's very much in control other than with feral colonies in the area where he lives. So um, he's at kind of hands off as far as that goes. If they live, they live. If they die, they die. It's a live or let live philosophy. But I have interviewed uh, treatment-free beekeepers that are dealing with genetics, and I pay attention to those people. Uh, I interviewed Corey Stevens recently. Corey Stevens is a queen breeder. He's in Missouri, and uh, he is you know, hit and miss some years. He's not doing great all the time, but he's working with genetics of survivor stock, and he is treatment-free. So that's recent. So there's another guy that I've interviewed. Another person that I've interviewed that uh, really invested heavily in treatment free to the point where he was willing to lose most of his stock to come out with survivor line stock. And that is somebody that I mentioned frequently. And that's the Bee Weaver line out of Texas. So Daniel Weaver uh, is a treatment free beekeeper and their genetics are derived from treatment free stock. So, and that's throughout, it's a multi generational beekeeper. So I do interview people on both sides. Uh, so treatment and treatment free. But I also, uh, in order to help people make their decisions, uh, my concerns are, and it's one of the things I really wanted when I started being a beekeeper. In 2006, when I learned about the disappearing bees, the vanishing bees, the uh, colony collapse disorder, and uh, David Hackenberg is in Pennsylvania. He's a big commercial beekeeper, and he's the one that first called them. He called it colony collapse, disappearing bees. He had stations where he was putting all of his hives, commercial hives that are mobile, and they stage them in different parts of the country for different parts of the year when they're not actively pollinating, and he was finding empty hives. So that got me concerned. I wanted to get involved. I wanted to know more about bees, and I wanted to keep bees. Well, ultimately, I started keeping bees of my own, so I could better access and observe, document, photograph, video, and learn about these bees, right? And I thought it only made sense to use treatment-free bees. So my research on treatment-free survivor stock is what it was called. Um, I reached out to a lot of different people. And the philosophy from uh, Daniel Weaver and his wife, Laura, uh, they run that uh, Bee Weaver apiary. And they're who I decided to get my survivor stock from. And when I did that, I had such great success with my bees. So the question was, could they even manage winter? You know, so would they even handle themselves here in the state of Pennsylvania? And they did. And uh, one of the real tests of that is if you're going to be inspected. Um, so every time the state inspector showed up, do you know that counting varro destructor mites in your hive is optional? So he always asks me, and he pulls up in his truck, he drops the tailgate, he's getting his stuff together. Do you want me to count for mites? Uh, it's not required, it's optional. We're just looking for brood disease and stuff like that. I said, oh no, we're counting mites. I definitely want to know my mite count. So the thing is, we walk around and I made a video of it. So it's on YouTube. You can see what a state inspection looks like. Those were my survivor stock. Those were the bee weaver bees. He, I think he might've found one mite and he tested every single hive in my apiary. So they were doing really well. So that's the thing. As long as they're doing well, you can be treatment free. You should not be hands off when it comes to keeping your bees. And here's why. This is, um, this is why it's such a, it's an impassioned area for people. Because frequently you'll hear people say, well, I think we know that the bees would do really well if people would just stop touching them because feral colonies do so well on their own. That is something that you're going to hear a lot of people say. And my question for them is, 
which feral colonies did you track and observe and look at? We tried to do a similar thing in the state of Pennsylvania. We tried to track bee trees. So these are feral colonies. It's called feral because they're non-native. They're at some point they were brought in and managed by people. And then of course, when they swarmed out, they occupied a tree cavity instead of someone's hive. So then we would think hands off, you know, this ties in with Dr. Thomas Seeley's are not forest research where they followed bee trees. But you know, when the Varroa destructor mites came out, uh, these feral colonies were just dying all over the place. They were just disappearing. But see, and this is where, this is where the hope, somebody throws out that little rope of hope to pull you out. A um, couple of the colonies didn't die. So then we would say, oh, those are survivors. So those will make it. Why don't we let all the bees die except for those that make it treatment free and then we'll work from those. That sounds good. To me, that sounds like a really good philosophy. Now, if you're a commercial beekeeper with millions invested, contracts to fulfill, you're not going to accept that method of control. And therefore, the people that are trying to do that method are going to get stepped on. So because the genetics are always going to mix, right? So, and this has happened even with, uh, I believe it was Randy Oliver that had a test yard that they were trying to find for instructor mites on. It was mite free and then out of the blue, seemingly out of the blue, um, all of a sudden this test yard where they had these, all these colonies that were Varroa mite free to the point where they were no longer good as a test yard because the whole point was to test mite treatments. But then they found out in a very short amount of time, their mite numbers dramatically increased. That left them all with question marks over their heads until they found out that there were unmanaged bee colonies nearby because I think someone had passed away. I don't know the full story, but there were colonies that were left to themselves. And what they did was they caused a cascade of infection that later came and occupied and infected their colonies. And we know that there is so much drift going on. So many bees are joining up in colonies that they're not genetically connected to. And therefore, whatever pathogens, parasites, whatever problems they have, they bring with them and they spread quickly through otherwise healthy colonies of bees. Now, the reason I bring this up is because um, I did go into treating my colonies because I lost 30% of my hives one winter and I was really bothered. And what happened at that time was I was committed to being treatment free. So what changed my mind? What changed my mind was uh, I was losing colonies. I was not having, you know, perfect success going through winter. And then so as far as why were my colonies dying, what was going on, were there varomites and things like that. So what happened was a new treatment became legal in the United States. What was it? Oxalic acid. When it, and I looked into the other countries that were using it, and it seemed like, why weren't we doing this all along? And so the first year that I started to implement oxalic acid vaporization, there were three methods of delivery that were approved. One was with a spray bottle, one was the drip, and the other was vaporization with these little pans that you put your oxalic acid crystals in, you stick them through the entrance, and they sublimate and deliver the vapor. So then, of course, I looked at all the test documentation. I looked at how they got that approved. I looked at what their practices were. So all of the components that got this approved for the United States were those three delivery methods. And then, of course, the dosing, which now is being challenged by a lot of people. But I'm explaining why I made this transition. It was considered an organic treatment. Um, oxalic acid is present in so many different plants. It's ubiquitous. It's already in your honey that the pre-treatment levels of oxalic acid in your honey and the post-treatment levels of oxalic acid in your honey were not measurable as far as the differences pre and post-treatment. And that seemed to make good sense to me. So then the other thing was that the first year that I tried this out, um, I had 100% survival going through winter. And remember I said that a lot of people, we gauge our backyard success on winter survival. So things that kill your bees uh, going through winter, is, mites are at the top of the list, 
diseases, starvation. So, and the starvation is 100% the beekeeper's fault. So if you're taking too much honey off and your bees are clustered and dead in spring and all wet because there weren't enough of them to fill the space or maintain everything, uh, that's beekeeper error. So what are the things under our control? Having the amount of feed that they need, having the right number of bees size for the hive that they're in. So not a giant hive for a small cluster of bees, right? And then helping them get parasites under control. All of these things make sense to me. So oxalic acid vaporization did it for me. And I haven't had to move past that. And I know what we're supposed to do because I go to all the lectures. I talk to all the professors. I talk to the entomologists. I talk to the research people. Uh, rotate treatments, rotate treatments. And so I bought, and it's sitting seven feet from me, two big boxes full of Formic Pro, untouched. And that's because if my mite numbers, this is the way I think, if my mite numbers are under control, with just oxalic acid, I don't move on to the next, you know, the nuclear option. I don't do that. So it has a two-year shelf life, and then it expires, and then it's garbage. So I'm very close to natural, you know, kind of holistic beekeeping. You know, I'm trying to be treatment-free, but I still treat when something pops up because I don't want to lose my apiary over it. I don't want to be like um, that out yard where there was another yard they didn't know about that ruined everything. This also happened to the Bee Weaver family. Daniel Weaver, they had thousands of colonies moved into another state so that they could have control over the area where the breeding was happening. And what happened was they all got infected because there was someone else who illegally, I know this is shocking, but true, commercial truck comes in and unloads hundreds of beehives in an area where they weren't allowed to be. And then they were impacting the genetics and spreading Varroa. So this is the climate that we're in right now. If I wanted to be treatment free right now, I need the person that's a thousand yards away from me to monitor their stock and monitor their mites. We need to know what's going on. We can't just fly blind. You can. I'm asking you not to. So you need, um, if you're going to be treatment free, let's follow someone that I profoundly respect. And doc, that's Dr. Thomas Seeley and his Darwinian beekeeping. He opens right up and says, this is not something commercial beekeepers are going to be willing to do because it results in smaller colonies, which is what happens in feral trees, frequent swarming, which is what happens again in small cavities in trees. And this is how we think those ultimately would have survived is by creating multiple generations untreated that we end up with those that would survive on their own. The flip side of that is, or they're all dead. So um, either is kind of a possibility, but if you're doing treatment free and you're monitoring for Varroa, it's not just hands off, it's hands on and finding out if you have varroa mites and if you've got a colony while you're treatment free, that is showing up with any kind of disease, any kind of mite load that's significant, you have to call the colony. Now, a lot of treatment free beekeepers are not willing to do that. So I am telling you that if you do that and you're not willing to call your colony, then your other option is you have to go into treatment because the one colony that's not making it is just going to impact the rest of the colonies in the apiary. And this study has been done time and again, where it's the one bad apple of bees that cascades through the adjacent colonies through drift and infects them all. So if you're not prepared to cull the colony of bees that is not meeting the standard that you need for them to survive, you're gonna to have to come up with a treatment um, and then you're going to have to pick whatever works. Uh, the Bee Informed Partnership collects statistics and they have a Sentinel apiary program where they test different apiaries and find out what's going on. And there's also an annual loss and management report. And then we find out uh, through the reporting of commercial beekeepers, sideliners, and backyard beekeepers, um, which ones are showing the greatest losses. And I, I know what the philosophy is going to be. 
the losses were greatest in treatment-free. Most treatment-free beekeepers, it used to be they all quit within three years. Now they're quitting within five. The bulk of them, a very high percentage of treatment-free beekeepers are not going past their fifth year. Um, the, and their losses are profound. So the other part of that is the treatment-free beekeeper who's not monitoring, because it's the other thing, do you monitor for mites? How do you do it? You would be amazed how many people raise their hands when you ask, do you not monitor for mites? Those who do not monitor don't count mites. Uh, it is amazing the number of them that there are. Um, the excitement that gets in their voices when they say, yeah, but they made it through winter. And how many winters have they made it through? Two winters. And that gives them this great sense of confidence that because they don't see mites, the bees are still producing honey, they're still brewed, all this stuff. Uh, it feels good, but these mite numbers can change in a second. And it's usually the third year, the third spring is when you're going to see the crash. So if there are treatment-free people that are they're absolutely doing it great. They are probably using many other integrated pest management practices, which includes brood breaks, splits, swarming, allowing your bees to swarm, letting them cycle out because that's a natural brood break. Part of integrated pest management, screen bottom board, enclosure underneath, traps, mites, all of these things together. And then let me tell you what's at the very top of that future the genetics of the bees. So, and here's where, here's where we can throw up our hands and say, well, that's super frustrating because the genetics of the bees that tend to do extremely well um, as far as mite control, right? We've got Purdue ankle biters. We've got the bee weaver line. We've got a bunch of bees that are demonstrating that they have this ability, but they're not excelling at uh, building a big brood. Or because keep in mind too, if they build up a lot of brood, what do they also have the potential? That's a lot more reproductive area for the varroa destructor mites. So those that have smaller broods swarm a lot, generate a lot of uh, brood breaks. They're also staying small and they're not going to be appealing to those who need thousands of bees to make the grade to go and provide pollination services for almonds, for example. This is the trouble we're in because it's, um, you can't really classify the people that are treatment free, but for me, if, if, if all I care about is learning more about the bees, then, you know, it's the commercial end of beekeeping that uh, has put them on the map. The only reason that the United States Department of Agriculture even cares about the bees that we have and manage is because they're part of our national product when it comes to generating income under the Department of Agriculture. If they were not a key player in pollination services and in almonds, for example, you wouldn't even be hearing about them because they're a non-native species, they're managed by people, and they need to demonstrate to the country that they have value. And their value is through agricultural benefit. So backyard beekeeping that's treatment free, that we keep these small colonies just because we like to see the bees buzzing around our yard, we're not on the map. So the long game, I've said from the beginning, is genetic. So what do I do for that? I support the people that are doing it. Um, when Corey Stevens comes out with a line of bees that's genetically superior and survivor stock, I'm going to throw my money at Corey and I'm going to say, sell me some of those queens. I want them. Uh, not because it's going to help me in production. I want to see how well they do, if they're really all they're cracked up to be. Bee Weaver, I support those people because they're doing the genetics. They're actually controlling genetics. And guess when that stops? Guess when the genetics and improvement of your bees, guess when they arrive at a point where they have the perfect bee and they don't have to do any more work? Never. The genetic selection, the selective breeding, the production of the right drones and the right queens never stops. It's every year, all year long. If you give up, the problem is these traits that make your bees treatment free tend to water down fast and they don't stay strong in the face of a bunch of other genetics that are inferior. It's so backwards that inferior bees, those that can't hold their own with varroa mites, 
are the ones that end up dominating the stock that otherwise would hold their own with Varroa striker mites. Did I just give Timothy a big long answer for a very simple question? Why don't I bring more treatment free beekeepers on my channel than the two that are mentioned? I do. I do. And there's and there's gonna be more. And as they as they succeed, we'll talk about it. But you're right, we don't get into the nitty gritty of exactly how they're keeping their bees. And uh, the reason is often there's profound loss. And uh, the Bee Informed Partnership reported the stats were terrible. Treatment free, they were not cutting it. So um, you really have to get people, you wanna know if a treatment free beekeeper is really has really good stock, you gotta see what they end up with in the spring and uh, find out what's going on with those bees. And often pride gets in the way and um, you can end up on the treatment free bandwagon and then when you've lost a whole bunch of your stock, heaven forbid all of them, um, they very quickly replenish their bees and try not to talk about it. And that's because they don't wanna to have to admit that whatever they did was wrong. And my point is if you don't admit what was wrong or if you don't admit that you had these profound losses, we don't have a ground, an honest scientific basis for moving forward with preferred genetics. So as long as we're hiding away the losses and the damage or the disease that comes along, because let's face it, Varroa destructor mites are disgusting little mites that carry diseases with them. And those diseases, if you had a disease-free mite, all you'd have is this parasite, which is bad enough. But the worst part is they have 10 or more pathogens with them different stuff that's attacking your bees and carrying itself out through your colony. So it is a very complicated system. And I'm not, again, telling you that you have to be treatment free. I'm not telling you that you have to treat. I'm trying to give you both sides of it. And I will continue to interview people that I think have real viable uh, backgrounds that can really share something meaningful about uh, how they're going treatment free and what the long run is. I also want to think that, uh, yeah, maybe I need to have a treatment-free page on my website so that people will be able to see in one spot all of the um, interviews that I've done with people that are managing their colonies that way on a large scale with really good uh, genetic practices. So I might try that. Moving on to question number seven, we have Matthew from Forsyth County, Georgia. I requeen my hive with a bee weaver queen. See, there, it's a bee weaver. I requeen my hive with a bee weaver queen early this year. That hive has consistently been the spiciest hive in my apiary, to the point where I couldn't even manage a mite count on it for comparison to the rest. Have you had any issues with their queens being aggressive or difficult to manage? I wanted to give this queen a shot as they're otherwise great performers, but I'm seriously considering requeening this hive yet again in the spring. Okay, so for Matt, here's the thing. Um, Bee Weaver, because of where they are, they're in Nova Soda, Texas. Um, if you get hot genetics from them, they wanna know about it right away. So keep in mind that when you produce queens and you know if the queens are mated and everything, you don't really understand what the traits are of their offspring until you've had them long enough for them to develop, right? So you won't know, if you get this big attitude change from a queen, you're not gonna see that until it's 30 days down the line. When they do, you really need to give that feedback to the Weaver family, because uh, they wanna know. And they may even send you a replacement queen. You can just kill the queen that you have and they'll send one uh, that's improved. Because some hot stock, if you're in Africanized honeybee territory, the chances for some of that stock to sneak in are always present. So I would contact them and yes, I would replace the queen. So if you've got a colony already, let's see. Did you just have the one bee weaver colony? Because here's what I do also. If um, I haven't had to replace a queen because they were too hot. But um, if I want to get rid of a queen because she's not a good performer for whatever reason, I pull that queen out and I let them make a replacement queen. If there are eggs present, there probably are. Uh, because you're gonna water down the genetics as I described before, because as soon as they produce a new queen, she's gonna fly out, she's gonna mate with drones, not this time of year, but in the spring, for example, when things are good. 
and then uh, you'll get new genetics and a month down the road you're going to see what kind of hive you have. So that's what I do. I don't personally, I wouldn't keep a hot bee, not for anything. Uh, because I bring a lot of people on my property. I'm a photographer. I do portraits. I have a grandson. I have, in fact, I have three grandsons. They're all in the bee yard at different times. I have a granddaughter who's only one. Last thing they're going to do is be attacked by some hot hive. If I had a colony of bees that I couldn't even get a mite count on, by the way, suit up, get in there, find out what the mite load is. I don't care how hot they are. I would want to know uh, what kind of mite load they had. And then while you're in there, if that queen makes herself known, that's so you can get her. You can isolate her. Get her out of there. And uh, that's what I would do. But I would let the Weaver family know that you got hot stock. Uh, they want to know. They really do. And they'll often, they'll give you a credit. I'll bet you they'll give you a credit for another queen. And because, like I said, you don't know. All right, question number eight. This comes from Brad. Brad is a frequent commenter, longtime viewer. So happy to see him. Uh, the video with your grandson was so special. So thank you for that. And there again, we're on the last question here. So if you haven't seen the video and you want to see an eight-year-old's perspective on beekeeping, it's pretty funny to me. And the sixth graders were great to send in all the questions for him. I don't know if we're going to do that in the future. We'll see how it goes. But anyway, I truly love it. You're very fortunate and great with him. Okay, so here's the thing. It says, you mentioned in the video that drones can't feed themselves. Is this true? And why do I often see their heads down in cells? Queens can feed themselves if they have to, correct? Okay, so here's the thing. Well, um, you'll frequently hear, and it's true, when people say drones cannot feed themselves. Queens do not feed themselves. Here are the reasons why. And I'm going to explain because, hang on for just a second. Because, for example, where does the feed come from? Flowers. So if we're getting nectar and pollen from flowers, we will not see a drone on a flower getting into the nectaries and getting its own resources. So I think we need to call that feeding itself. Uh, the drones, when they're, drones are fed heavily by nurse bees, right? So once again, they're not feeding themselves. Now, this is the fun part. And the reason this comes up, I think, is because when my grandson was doing his explanation and answering his questions, he had a drone on his hand and we talked about how it's just going to die. He even says it's, it's going to die. And it did. It died today. So I got all the updates. He's very sad about it. Drones die. They don't feed themselves. Does this mean they cannot feed at all unless another bee is putting it in their mouth? Well, the bees that are receiving food, whether it's the queen or whether it's a drone, they stick their little tongues out. And if you've ever seen them, they're the tiniest tongues you've ever seen. You can start to realize how kind of worthless they are as a tool for the drone. So they, they use their four limbs and they really harass nurse bees. Nurse bees open up their mandibles and they let the drone feed. And of course they produce, usually it's honey or nectar or some combination. They also sometimes feed a mix of nectar, honey, and some pollen comes with it, and the drones consume that. So exactly what diet the drone is getting, I don't know. Um, so the other thing is the queen, same thing. The queen gets fed all the time. <clears throat> now, if she weren't fed, it's the quality of her food that allows her to continue to produce eggs. So now let's separate those two things. Let's say that we have this drone, and it's a favorite thing that I do. We collect drones from landing boards. They're dying anyway. We have a great, today was a good example. You know, it was in the opening sequences. There are drones literally being pushed out of the hives. They're on their own. They're going to die. Can those drones that are pushed out of the hives feed themselves? No, they're doomed. <clears throat> However, if they were allowed to stay in the hive, could a drone feed itself? It could. Actually, if it gets to, because Brad mentioned here, why do I see their heads in cells sometimes? Well, first of all, in most of the worker cells, those drones can't get their fat heads in those holes anyway. But if it's a larger diameter cell and if it's being used for honey or they're storing nectar, which is what a lot of them are doing right now, they're finishing off the nectar, 
So if you see the top of it, drones are good and bad at things. They're very good at mating. That's their job. Their entire abdomen is oversized to accommodate their massive reproductive organs. I don't want to say too much about that, but they're big, they're bulky, they're the heaviest bee in the hive, and they need a lot of food to keep up with that. So if a drone has access and is not being fed by a worker, but it can get that little undersized tongue in contact with nectar or honey somewhere in the hive, it can drink it, it can consume it. So, <clears throat> but it won't last long. So even if you have your drone and you get a little pipette out and you squirt out a little bit of honey, you'll see its little pathetic tongue come out and it will touch on that honey and it will consume it. Even though you make that readily available, 24 hours later, uh, chances are it's gonna be dead. So I explained this and my grandson decided he's gonna keep his little drone alive and he took it home with him and uh, he fed it little bits of honey. And sure enough, its little tongue came out and it could consume it. This is not a life-sustaining mix of food. It is minimal sustenance to tide the drone over until he actually can tease another worker bee, a nurse bee, to feed him the good stuff. So their tongues can come out, they can consume. It's not enough to sustain the drone. Now let's go to the queens. Can a queen feed herself? Remember what the queen is being fed is very important. It's for the production of uh, eggs. So she gets pollen and everything. So when we find out the food that's being consumed by queens, they've dissected queens before because they want to find out what's in their digestive system. So they get into their ventricula and they, and they cut it open and they look to see if there's pollen and all that stuff and there is. So they're being fed proteins. So the queen is being fed proteins. Now the queen on her own, is she going to be able to gather food and resources? People have fed queens little droplets of honey and the queen, same, just like the drone, her little tongue will come out and she'll consume it. This is survival. These are sea rations. It is just enough to keep her going. And, uh, but in order for her to really thrive, she's gonna need food that's produced by other bees. And the drone, in order for them to continue going, they're going to need food produced by nurse bees. And so they can consume nectar, they can consume some honey, it just doesn't sustain them. And you can do the test yourself. This is the time of year to do it. You've got dead drones around, if you've got little kids, and you want to see their sad little faces while they try to feed their drones. You see that tiny tongue come out and then you realize uh, how it's kind of doomed and you just prolong the inevitable, which is that your little drone is going to die. So in a meaningful sense of the word, they still, they just can't feed themselves. Can they eat without being fed? They can, it's just pitiful. It just doesn't, it's not enough. And I think people that breed queens um, that, uh, see them emerge from their queen cells and their banking queens and things like that. I, in a perfect world, those are gonna be fed by bees, but I think that some people have tried to tide them over by giving them thin honey. And I think that, that they'll take the honey, but again, you won't get longevity out of that. You're gonna need the nutrition that comes from nurse bees feeding those queens to keep them healthy and viable. And if you know more or something countered that, feel free to put a comment down in the comment section. Okay, so that's the end of it for today. And uh, so what are the, you know, what's the plan of the week right now if you're in the Northeastern United States? Frost is coming, all your entrances should be small. Everything is intensified. The, um, the yellow jackets are still out there. And when we get this freeze coming, you're gonna see the numbers drop pretty dramatically. And uh, it's a lot of fun right now because you can grab uh, yellow jackets with your fingers, pick them up, impress your friends, because there's a lot of little males flying around right now. And if you can, if you can positively identify the males from the females, then you can uh, just grab them up and get a closer look while they try to chop you with their little meat cutting mandibles that are kind of sad too. But uh, anyway, uh, what else? You need to transition if you're feeding liquid syrup you know, liquid syrup. 
If you're feeding syrup on your hives and it's that extra heavy two to one or whatever, because you're trying to fatten up a hive, it's time to think about pulling that away. Now we're gonna go to the solid feeds that can handle uh, being frozen. So that would be fondant, dry sugar, sugar breaks, candy boards, whatever you're gonna use uh, for wintering. Um, those will be going on at the end of next week around here. So wherever you are, if you don't have that stuff already, be thinking about it. My number one choice for all of that is going to be again this year, Hive Live Fondant Packs. Uh, they have the new five pounds, which I think is too much. <laughs> so I got those anyway, more so I could show it to people at my bee club and things like that so we can talk about them. Um, but these are the fondant packs. I know it makes some people very upset that we, we are telling people about those, but they work and uh, I think it's my responsibility to talk to you about emergency resources that could keep your bees from being a starved cluster in spring. So that's it. That's all we have for today. So I want to thank you for spending your time with me and I hope that you benefited from some of the things that we talked about. I realize that this is a lot for new beekeepers to think about. And uh, if you're thinking treatment or treatment free, please find a very good mentor who has done that for years and made it work and uh, find someone who's really being transparent about what these challenges are and also the risks that you pose. If you choose to be a hands-off beekeeper, I have to say I can't support that because we're not keeping bees in a vacuum. We have other beekeepers around us and we have a responsibility to raise very healthy stock and do the best we can for them. So thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Thank you.